evening. Uh, we're going to start immediately because we have only 90 minutes, perhaps 100 minutes, and we want to use every single one of them. Uh, most of you, it seems, were uh, here yesterday, so you know who this nice gentleman is. Uh, for those who don't know, he's a game designer and the guy that um, decided not to invest in Magic the Gathering. <laughs> so, uh, let's start. The best players have the best games is the uh, topic of today's talk. We're going to talk for between 20 and 60 minutes. And afterwards, uh, we have time for questions in alphabetical order. My name is Andrea, so I'm first. Uh, that's it. Let's proceed. All right. I think I think he's the the DM who's making his own rules here. That's his own order. Well, uh, thank you so much uh, for coming and uh, spending uh, the evening with me. And, uh, you know, again, thank you to Libernicon for bringing me all the way from the other side of the world to come here and enjoy uh, a wonderful weekend. Um, so, uh, I wanted to talk tonight about uh, role playing games in general. And, uh, you know, this. The things that I'm going to say, you know, apply to Dungeons and Dragons or, or any game that you ever want to play. Uh, as long as uh, if it's got a game master and it's got players, these these rules and these tips will will apply. Um, and you know, I have well, I've been uh, playing role playing games for more than forty years, and uh, I've been working professionally on them for. Uh, more than 30 years. Um, I, I started uh, writing right when I was still in the university, uh, so I've never had a real job. Uh, <laughs> uh, always been doing this, this silly game stuff. But, um, you know, after all that time, I've come to the realization that my goal, my real interest, is in just helping people to have a good time. And uh, whether that sells products or whether it doesn't or what, I, like I, I, I don't even really concern myself with that anymore. It's if if I think it'll make people's experience at the table better, uh, that's that's what I'm I'm interested in. Um, so I just have a few tips. Um, you know, this is the kind of thing that we could talk about for a, a whole week of, of lectures, um, but, uh, but I'm going to try to distill down uh, some real basic things here tonight, and uh, we're going to start with Game Masters, and then we'll move on to players. And the thing that is, you're going to see a lot of here is um, the, the tips for Game Masters really come down to the various things that you can do to make sure that everyone around the table is having a good time. And uh, I will I will spoil uh, the player tips in that they're really about the same thing too. I think everyone, it's everyone's job at the table to help everyone else have a good time. But uh, to get more into some specific tips, um, we're going to start with choices. We're going to talk a little bit about that because, um, you know, last night when we were talking, I mentioned that uh, ultimately a role playing game is a conversation, right? The game master says, here's what you see, here's what's going on, what do you do? The player says what they do. And, the player, and then the GM says, okay, well, that, this is what happens, and it's just back and forth. But you can look at it a different way, which is role-playing games are games about making choices, right? You choose to take an action, and the game master tells you what happens as a result, right? You you uh, 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 try something out, and you find out what happens, right? I, I, I attack the monster, you know, I find out if, if I, you know, inflict damage, I open the door and I find out, you know, that there's something wonderful on the other side or there's something horrible on the other side. Um, and so, uh, 
it's, it's, it's important as the game master to make sure that you give the players real choices. If you, uh, if the if the game doesn't give the players real choices, if the players don't feel like their choices matter, you know, if if it doesn't matter what way they go through the woods, they're going to end up at the castle that you really want them to end up at. Then they didn't really have a choice at all, and it's important to feel like you know what I try to do matters. You know, it's. Uh, it's one of the real strengths of a tabletop role-playing game as opposed to like a, a computer game because you know the computer game has only so many choices built into it you can't you know it, it might seem like it's got an infinite number of choices but it doesn't right the, the developers have picked choices for you and you have to choose from them but in a role-playing game where you've got a living breathing dungeon master game master there with you you can do anything. And that was what drew me to role-playing games to begin with, and uh, and still to this day remains uh, one of my favorite things about them, right? There's just no limit. There's no limit to the, uh, the creative uh, choices that you want to make. And and so, um, you know, it's it's important to keep the, the to give them meaningful choices. Um, you know, if you are, again, walking, you know, you're walking through the dark and spooky woods and the path goes left and the path goes right, and left and right, they, those choices look exactly the same, then it's really just random. Uh, you, you, you don't know what, what it's going to be. But if you want to make it a meaningful choice, well, you know, there's a, there's a trail of blood that goes off to the path uh, to the left or, or to the right, and, uh, you know, Suddenly, now it's the choice. Well, do we go where there might be danger, um, or do we go the safer way, or do we go where there might be someone injured? Do we want to help them, or do we go the other right? And so you get to make that choice, and you get to base it on something. And the other thing that is very similar to this is uh, player motivation. Um, you, 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 as the game master of your group of friends. You know your players better than anybody, much better than a game designer could know, uh, you know, better than anybody. Um, and so you know what will motivate them, you know what they're interested in, and so you can give them what you know that they'll be interested in, right? If you, if you're running a game and you look around and everyone is kind of looking at their phone or staring off into space and looking bored, that's not their fault. Uh, that's probably the game master's fault. And the game master should be the one who knows how to interest the, the players. And so figuring out what their motivations are. And, and of course, there's character motivation and there's player motivation. And sometimes those are different, right? The character might be really interested in getting gold. Uh, but the player might be interested in, you know, really likes, you know, fighting monsters or, or whatever. Um, and, uh, and so kind of understanding both of those things and uh, allowing the players, like, I often think of motivation as like, uh, you, the player, the player motivation is pointing them where they're going to go. Um, they're going to go, you know, toward what they're motivated to go toward, and so it, it behooves the game master to make sure that they're pointed in the right way, right? And you can do that by uh, uh, utilizing the motivation and the goals that the players have, and make sure that you know if if the players are motivated because they they uh, really uh, want to go visit the elves. Um, then, then you can make that journey to the elven village or whatever as interesting as possible, right? And because you, you know that's the way they're going to go. Uh, I also wanted to. Uh, so last night I mentioned this, um, but I'm going to talk about it in more depth here. So this is the shared imaginary space. Is what is my term for uh, you know the the game master explains what the what the setting is, what the what you know, what the players see. You know, the, the game master is the the all the senses of the of the players, right? The, 
Game Master tells the players what their characters see and what they hear, um, sometimes what they smell. And uh, the more you can engage with the players uh, about those things, the more the picture that they have in their head about what's going on in the shared imaginary space uh, is going to look like what's in your head. And what the shared imaginary space of two different players is going to be more similar. And that's the goal, right? The goal is if the players are you know, in uh, this dark, forbidding forest, and you've described the trees and, and you know, the strange animal calls that they hear, like everyone should have the same movie playing in their head, right? Everyone should kind of see the same thing. Um, and, and the reason that's so important is because that's, that's where the game is going on. And you, if not, if everyone doesn't have the same shared imaginary space, people are gonna make choices, right? Because we talked about choices. Um, that are not that aren't going to make sense to everyone else, right? Like how many times have you, when you're playing, you know, somebody says, "Well, I'm going to go uh, poke around and see if there's anything behind the bookcase," and another player says, "Oh wait, there's a bookcase," right? And, and that just kind of comes from a breakdown of creating that shared imaginary space. And one of the ways to do that, and we again we mentioned this last night. Um, one of the ways to do that is to give a very sort of brief overall description when the players come into a situation and then uh, allow the players to ask questions, right? Because the players are going, they're going to zero in on the things that they're most interested in and they're going to start asking you questions about that. And it, it is a way for the player to explore the area even as the character is exploring the area. And you know, if you if you just describe everything at length, all all the way at the front, um, they're going to forget, right? Uh, you know, we were uh, uh, we were at a, a a restaurant for lunch today, and uh, uh, we didn't understand because I only speak English, I don't speak Croatian. I didn't understand all the choices that the the waiter was giving us, and so you know, he gave like three or four choices, and uh, the people I was with couldn't remember what the first couple of choices were by the time he was done with all of them, you know, to translate for us. And, uh, you know, I think that made me think about describing something in a role-playing game, right? If you, if you tell them about six important things in, in the room or whatever, uh, they're probably going to forget the first couple. Um, I also want to, by pacing, uh, Pacing is another thing that I, really, I think is really, really important uh, when you're running a game. It's the kind of thing I could give a whole talk just on pacing. But what I mean by pacing is it's the game master's job, if you see things kind of starting to bog down, uh, you know, um, we, were, uh, we were just outside talking about um, uh, you know, in an old D and D game of mine, a player had come upon a throne, and there were all these jewels and gems set into the throne. And one player was just convinced that there were, those were buttons that he could push, and something would happen. And you know, probably spent two hours of game time. You know, well now I push all the red ones. Oh, that didn't work. Oh, now I, you know, and uh, it's the game master's job to keep that from bogging down like that. Um, and so, you know, if things start to, you know, you can kind of tell everyone else is getting bored and, and you know, sort of, they're spinning their wheels, the Game Master should do something to help things move along, right? Something interesting and exciting happens, there's an interesting noise off in the distance. Uh, something like that that kind of brings the energy back, right, and, and gets things moving again. At the same time, um, if you're playing a game and it's just encounter after encounter after encounter and, and, and you know, you, there's so much happening, it's the Game Master's job to slow things down a minute and say, okay, uh, let's uh, you know, give the players a, a moment to kind of catch their breath. Um, maybe everyone can you know, sort of reassess and, and figure out what's going on, see who's hurt and, and whatnot. Um, I think that that is... Um, uh, that controls the pace. It's just like if uh, you were a screenwriter and you're writing a movie 
and you know you you want to give the audience a chance to kind of catch their breath and you know if it's an action movie and Tom Cruise is just running and running and running uh, you know you need to give uh, the audience a chance to kind of say okay what I don't even remember what's going on I, I gotta, gotta gotta catch my breath here um, and so uh, like one of the things that gyms can do to uh, to and this, this plays very much into the shared imaginary space point, is that uh, like if you're having an encounter and it's been going on for half an hour, 45 minutes, it's probably worth your time to take a moment and re-describe the what's going on, where the you know where the bad guys are and where the uh, you know the evil altar is or something like that, because people will forget. Right, the, it, you know, over that the course of that much time, um, and it's also a chance to slow things down and give everybody a chance to kind of reassess. So uh, pacing can be really, really important. And oh, wrong way. <laughs> um, so this is very closely related to pacing. Uh, I think that it, when possible, when you're starting a session, and you know. Uh, it's probably worth mentioning that, that role-playing games are unique in that uh, we have this unit of time measurement called a game session, which doesn't really equate to anything else, right? It's, it, it's not like a scene in a movie because it's probably multiple scenes, and it's not really like a chapter in a book, but it's not a whole book either. It's, it's kind of its own thing. Um, you know, it's just when you decide to start playing and when you decide to stop. And so I think that a way to get things moving really fast and get everyone excited is to try to make it so that you can start your session with something exciting. It doesn't have to be a fight, but, but something really interesting. Because you don't want to start a session, you know, with low energy and just, okay, well... You're in a tavern. Uh, what, what, what do you do? Uh, you know, you, you don't want that. Um, you want you know something interesting and exciting. So you know, even if that tavern is important for the session and the adventure, you know, start them outside the tavern, and then there's two merchants and they're arguing, right? Or or something like that, where it's just immediately there's something to do, there's something to interact with, and at the same time, I think. If you can try to end the session, you know, sometimes you don't have full control, right? Because somebody, you know, somebody will just suddenly say, oh, you know, I, I, I've got to get up early for work tomorrow morning. Uh, I, got, I got to go. Um, but, but when you have at least some control over things, if you can end with, uh, you know, sometimes people will use the term cliffhanger of, of you know, something like, really, really threatening. And it doesn't have to be that, but it should be, there should be a question. You know, what, what is, you know, on the other side of this, of this canyon? What is, uh, you know, we're, here we are, we're talking to the queen, you know, what is she going to say? Um, you know, that, that kind of thing where, so that, you know, maybe in the intervening time before the next session starts, the players will, you know, ruminate on that. They'll think about it and, uh, you know, it'll kind of keep them a little bit engaged. Oh, it, or, or if nothing else, when you sit down to play the next session, um, they'll all, you know, be sort of focused on, well, what, what is on the other side of the canyon, right? They're, they'll, they'll all wonder the same thing. Um, I just wanted to throw this out. I know that, that everybody knows this, but um, <laughs> there is more to do in a game than just combat. Uh, a lot of the games uh, that we play, you know, have very detailed rules about, you know, combat and hit points and, you know, all that sort of thing. And that's, and that's great and that's fun and it's exciting. But don't forget that some people want to, you know, explore, right? Some people want to solve a mystery. Some people want to talk to the NPCs and learn more about the world or, or whatever. And, um, and, and, you know, they, they deserve their, their time in the sun uh, just as much. Um, I think that uh, a really good, you know, when we start talking about a, a really good dungeon master, um, 
one of the traits that I see is that they really work to evoke emotion out of the players. And, you know, a really easy one is fear, right? And, you know, you can just do that with that dragon has, you know, what armor class? Uh, and, you know, that, you know, kind of straightforward. But, but you know, like, like a trick that I use all the time is I, uh, I make sure that when the players are interacting with a lot of uh, NPCs, uh, there's at least one person that they're going to interact with who's going to be just a really good guy. Uh, he, uh, you know, helps them. He's generous. He's nice, and and he's and, and he, it's not a trap. It's not a trick. He really is super nice. And then he gets in danger, right? He becomes the person who you know the bad guys kidnap or you know is 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 really in in trouble. And suddenly, you don't even have to motivate the players at all. Uh, they're gonna, oh, we gotta save him, right? Yeah, you know, what? He's, he's a sweetheart, right? You know, we can't let anything bad happen to him. He gave us these delicious cookies, you know? Um, and I use, that, I use that technique a lot. And I think it's a reaction because, um, you know, when I was much, much younger, there was uh, a tendency, I'd, I'd play in other people's games sometimes, and there was a tendency that all the NPCs were mean, right? They were all jerks, and you just kind of learned to just, you know, kind of hate them, and, you know, we like us, you know, the players, you know, just like you, like the, like other players and other player characters, and we don't care about the NPCs. But if you can make them care about the NPCs, well, then you've got them under your spell. <laughs> Uh, I think the last point for, for Game Masters tonight is, um, is just a simple check-in. Um, and what I mean by this is maybe at the end of the session, maybe in between sessions, you can just kind of say real, you know, casually, you know, how, how do you think things are going? Are you having fun? Uh, uh, is, is, are things going the way you, you know, thought they would? You know, it, it, it's not, you're not saying, I want to give you everything that you want. Um, but you are saying, hey, I care if, if you're having a good time. And you should care if they're having a good time, because that's why they keep coming back session after session, uh, is to have a good time. And you know, and sometimes they'll, uh, your players will, will tell you something that you weren't expecting at all. You know, like, uh, oh, I was really sad when that guy who gave us all the cookies was killed. Um, and, <laughs> You know, you, you, you didn't realize that, and uh, it, it becomes something that you'll remember. Oh, okay, so that guy actually meant a lot to them, so uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna remember that for next time. So it's just important, you know, it's just, it just comes down to basic communication. Um, there doesn't have to be a wall between the players and, the, and the, the DM. Everyone is there for the same reason. You all wanna play a fun game. So let's move on to players. So the first player tip that I have is to create an appropriate character. If you, uh, if you show up at somebody's role-playing game um, and you know, they've said, OK, we're going to play uh, this fantasy game and, and you know, with elves and dwarves and whatnot, and you show up and you've got a you know, guy with a machine gun, um, or, or, or maybe even more likely, right? Like, if you are invited to play in the game and you show up with a character that you know doesn't ever talk to anybody else, you're the loner and you keep to yourself and whatnot. But you're sitting, but but you know, a role playing game is meant to be a game where everyone talks and interacts. I, I think of that as like you know someone invited you to their to their house to play poker and you brought dice, right? There, you 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 just you brought the wrong equipment to the game, um, and it is the player's responsibility to bring a character that will fit into the world and the adventure and whatnot that the game master is 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 playing is is making, and um, it, it it's. It's kind of a. I, I'll go so far as to say that I think it's it's a it's a matter of respect, 
right? You, you know, the game master's probably put a lot of work into whatever he's going to run, and so you don't want to put up a barrier to, to what he's done. You don't want to throw a wrench into his plans. You want to make something so that, oh, you've got this great adventure, I have a character that will participate in this great adventure. And uh, I think that uh, it's just a way that you can show that you're, you're there to par really participate. Um, and it's very closely related to this point. Um, and this seems really obvious. And we were talking about Game Masters a moment ago and talking about how you have to keep your, your players uh, motivated and whatnot. But it's also the responsibility of the players to, to not just pay attention, but to be curious, right? Like, like you're going to have more fun if you really are wondering what's, on, what's inside that castle, right? What's on the other side of the river? What's, what's living down in that cave? Um, if you come with that attitude, you're gonna have more fun because there probably is something really cool in that castle or in that cave. And uh, wanting to go investigate it is, is it, it leads to more fun. And it makes the game master feel really good, right? Because he worked really hard to put something interesting in the castle and you're investigating it and, and you're 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 kinda of, you're creating a feedback loop and you know, oh you created something interesting? Oh I I I'm really interested in that. And then, you know, next time he's going to make sure that he creates something interesting again. And it's just gonna, you know, kind of uh, blossom that way. And you know I, I think it goes almost without saying that there's nothing worse if you're the, the dungeon master or the game master and you look around the table and everyone is bored and not paying attention and looking at their phone and uh, it, it, it feels, you know, you feel like, oh, I'm just, I'm just boring you. Uh, you know, why, why are we even here? And it's very disheartening. So uh, you want to keep the, you want to keep the GM happy if you can. Um, it just, it's good for everybody. This is also very closely tied to it, and that's be flexible. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, if you just really want to fight things and just have, you know, you're just going to run from, you know, room to room and just attack everything. But there are other players there who would like to, you know, investigate or, or search around and see if there's anything interesting and find an interesting puzzle to solve. Um, you need to be flexible enough to uh, uh, adapt to them because they're going to be flexible and adapt to you and, and, and they're going to do what you want to do. I guess this is kind of getting into a point that I, uh, is coming up too. But, um, and, you know, it, it, it comes with your relationship with a game master too. To be, you want to be flexible. Um, uh, you know, if you really just want, you know, your, your goal, you decide you want your goal to be, you know, I'm going to be a, a king of this kingdom, and that's, that's your goal, and you're going to work toward it, that's, that's great, that's a, that's a wonderful goal, um, but you also have to realize that it, it might not work out, right, and, and that doesn't mean that you're a failure or the game is a failure, um, and, you know, maybe you're, as you go along in your story, you'll find a different form of success and and you won't even care about being king anymore and and that just shows uh, uh, that that sort of flexibility I think that um, you know we often talk about the game master and how he's created this world and you know when I say he it, it, I also mean he, he or she when the, they have created this world um, we, we talk about that but we often forget to talk about the creativity that the players put into things. And, uh, and I don't necessarily mean that you take a part of the world and you start making it up, but, uh, but, but to a degree you can, because um, in small ways, right, you can name your horse, right? You can uh, you know, describe to the other players the, the fancy hat that you just bought that you are very proud of and your character looks really cool in. And you know that's that's you creating something that you are then describing to the group, and and then suddenly we can 
go back to what we were talking about with Game Masters and the, and the value of good description and whatnot, but now it's the player who's describing something brand new like that. Um, you can also, uh, uh, you know, if, if the Game Master uh, allows it and, and is, is fine with it, you know, when you, you can create your own background and, and even add to the world, right? If you say, well, you know, my, my father was a pirate and, you know, did all these things and his, his ship was, uh, you know, was this, had this name and was infamous, you know, uh, all, all along the coast for, for being a pirate, you know, maybe the Game Master didn't, hadn't thought about pirates, Right, but but he you know he says oh that that's actually really cool and then adds that into the world and suddenly you participated in creating a part of the world along with the game master and that kind of interaction can be really rewarding I feel um, and you know maybe at some point it will actually lead to the point where you are going and in, in uh, uh, interacting with the pirates. Uh, along the coast that the game master had never even originally thought of, but you did, and and now you're in, you know you are you are active participant in integration of the world. I think that's that's really rewarding and special. Um, this is very related to being flexible and, and that be okay with failure. Um, you know we we watch movies or we read books all the time where. Uh, the main character will will fail sometimes, right? And you know, usually like in the middle of the story, they'll they'll try something and it will fail, and then they'll have to try something else and learn something more, and then they can succeed. But my my experience, what I've seen is is players don't like that. Um, players want to just succeed, 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 and I think that you know. In a game that's ruled by dice, uh, just uh, logically, you're going to fail sometimes, right? You're going to roll really poorly. The monsters are going to roll really well, and you know maybe maybe you don't die, but you you know you get really injured and you have to run away. And it's it's that point where you have to kind of separate yourself from your character. Yes, your character feels terrible because you had to run away from this important battle, or you had to you know give up on solving this mystery or whatever, and uh, and, and your character can feel terrible. But you as a player can maybe look at it and say, well, you know that's that's an interesting part of the story, and now. Um, you know, we can take the events that result out of that failure and we can make an even better story, right? Because, you know, because the villain beat us the last time, now we really want to win and, you know, we, we want to get our revenge on him and suddenly the, the, the tension and the stakes are raised and, and it becomes a much better story because there was failure in there. Uh, so, so don't be afraid of failure. It, it can actually make for a better game. Uh, this is, again, uh, kind of related to being flexible. Um, you know, it is, it's a matter of, uh, uh, you know, everyone has, everyone plays role-playing games for different reasons, and they get different benefits out of playing the game. Maybe one person really likes interacting with the rules and, you know, showing how we can add all these different abilities together and create this really powerful character or whatever, but somebody else just really likes to uh, get into their character and role play and, and talk in a, in a funny voice and uh, do all those kinds of things. And, you know, it, you should do what you, you should find what you want in, in the game and you should pursue it, right? If you're the rules guy, be the rules guy, unless that means that you're kind of trampling on, on, on someone else, right? You, you have to make room for someone else's love uh, so that you can enjoy your own. And, uh, you know, it can be kind of tricky. Uh, it, it requires you to pay attention not only to the events of the game, but, but to the people around the table, right? If you uh, are, you know, focusing on the rules and, you, and you've created this character that just kills everything and, and it's kind of stealing away everyone else's fun because all you're doing is fighting things um, and, and, and winning, winning, winning. 
and you look around and everyone else is, is kind of bored or is disappointed or would really like to be doing something other than following you around on your murder spree, uh, then you know, pay attention to that and, and give them some room so that they can have their kind of fun. And if you do that, Lo and behold, they'll be more willing to follow you on your murder spree, right? Uh, it, you know, it, it, it's a give and take. And this is very closely related. Uh, I, I call this share the spotlight, um, and, and that just is, if, if you've got one person in the group who uh, does all the talking, you know, whenever the game master says, what do you do, they're the first one in and, and says what they want to do and, and describes all their actions and whatnot and is kind of trampling on everyone else's words, um, you know, don't be that person, right? Uh, nobody really likes playing with that person uh, because, you know, we're all there to play. We all want a chance. Everyone's got uh, a, an, an opportunity. I mean, one of the things, <laughs> you know, one of, the, one of the great things about most role-playing games is, is that the characters are very diverse and they're all good in different situations. And one of the reasons for that is that it means that everyone gets a chance to shine, right? If it's a fight, the fighter gets to go and really, you know, hack around with his sword. But if it's, you know, a magical uh, puzzle, then the wizard kind of steps forward and uses his arcane knowledge and his spells. And, you know, e everyone has their moment. And you, you want to make sure that you give them. And, and that this is a good advice for game masters, too. Make sure that you give everyone... Uh, their, their sort of moment. And, oh, you know, actually, one more thing I wanted to say about uh, sharing the spotlight. Uh, you know, we, we kind of know, uh, you know, role-playing games that started, uh, whatever, uh, 45, 50 years ago, and we know a lot more about uh, people in psychology now. And so, for example, um, you know, in my group, we talk a lot about, you know, some of us are introverts, some of us are extroverts, right? Some of us are kind of quiet and reserved, some of us are very talkative and whatnot. And when you recognize those differences, um, it, it becomes very, very useful in, in a role-playing game, right? And often it's the game master's responsibility uh, if they see someone who's kind of, you know, at the other end of the table and paying attention but not saying anything, not contributing, um, it, it's often the game master's responsibility to say, you know, well, what do you want to do, right? Because some people need that kind of invitation, right? They're not going to just jump in. But here's the thing that uh, I don't see enough of, and that's other players seeing that and focusing on that, right? And so, you know, if you're a player and you notice that the person next to you hasn't spoken in a, a while and hasn't contributed anything, turn to them and say, well, you know, what do you think we should do? What, what's your character doing right now? Uh, it doesn't have to come from the game master. It's not all the responsibility of, of sort of managing everyone's fun needs to be on the game master. The players can also contribute. Um, okay, so um, get to know the rules in the world. This is another way uh, to make your Game Master happy. And again, making the Game Master happy is always a good idea. Um, but, but really, uh, you know, if, if, you, if you're new to the game, that's fine, right? You might not know all the rules, that's totally fine. If you've been playing this game for two years, and you still don't remember how to roll to make your skill check, uh, and you need to ask what, how, to, how that works, what die do I roll, that slows the game down and, you know, makes, it, it can make the Game Master feel like, oh, do you really not care? You know, you've been doing this for two years, haven't you figured this out? And the same goes for the, rule, for the world, right? Like, the Game Master has put a lot of work into, uh, it, you know, craft, crafting some kind of world, even if it, even if they're using a, a, a pre-made setting, even if you're playing the Forgotten Realms or Greyhawk or whatever, um, you know, the Game Master has invested a lot of work. He's created uh, NPCs and, you know, talked about, you know, this is the king of this land and over here uh, is, is the queen of this realm. And when you start talking about those things with some amount of knowledge, uh, 
you're going to make the Game Master feel so good because, you know, oh, they've really been paying attention is what they, you know, the Game Master will think. You know, oh, you, you remembered the name of the queen and you remembered that, you know, that kingdom hated this kingdom and, and oh, and, and this, the, the followers of this deity are, are interested in that and, you know, you're engaging with the fictional world on some level as though it's, it's real that makes the, the Game Master feel great and it also makes all the other players get more immersed in the game. You know, we do it all the time. You know, uh, you know, if you get three Star Wars fans together and you start talking about Star Wars and the world of Star Wars and they're, you know, talking about, well, Jawas all do this and the Sand people don't like that. And, you know, talking about them as though they're real. Well, you can do the same thing in a, in a role-playing game. And it doesn't, you don't have to just rely on the Game Master to give that information. If you've taken, you know, a few notes, or, or just pay attention, um, you'll, you'll, you'll be able to participate in these discussions, and it makes the experience richer for everyone. And I think, I think oh no, I think I have one more. Yes. Uh, this is another one that goes toward both Game Masters and players, really. Um, and, and this is one of those things, again, we never talk about, uh, but, you know, most of the time when you're playing a role-playing game, I mean, I know that there are exceptions, but most of the time you go to somebody's house, right, and you're sitting around their table and, uh, you know, if you uh, are, are too loud, you're going to wake the kids or you're going to you know, wake the parents or, uh, you know, um, when you leave, if, if the table is covered with you know, empty soda bottles and beer cans and, and, and half-eaten sacks of chips, uh, you know, you, you've, you've left them with a, a, a big mess. And, um, you know, it, it just behooves us all, I think, to be really good guests in other people's homes, um, and it, it shows a, a great deal of respect. And at the same time, you know, if you're the person whose house everyone's going to, being a good host, making sure that everyone has a drink or, or whatever. Um, it, it, it's one of those things that we, we, we don't think about uh, when it comes to role-playing games, but it's actually really important. And it can really make the game a lot better if you sort of abide by those you know, social nice rules um, that we all should know, um, but we don't always remember because we're too interested in armor class and, and hit points. And, um, you know, it's just, it's just a, a good general thing. Um, uh, a lot of these things that I've talked about for both players and uh, game masters, um, and, and a lot more besides, um, I, I felt moved to put into a book. Uh, and... Uh, this book is called Your Best Game Ever, and it's a, it's a guide to just having a great game, very much like what we've been talking about tonight. And um, if you want, if you're interested, I'm not here to, to give you a sales pitch, um, but if you're interested, um, you can get this book for 50% off. Um, only, you can, only you can do this because only you know this code. It's specific for the convention. Um, but... Uh, uh, if, if you're at all interested, you can go to uh, our website and, and get this book. Uh, the book has all of this and much, much more, lots more uh, uh, advice for game masters about world building and building adventures, and uh, uh, there's even um, some recipes for drinks and snacks and food and stuff for, you know, if you're hosting the game, you want to tailor it to a fantasy or a sci-fi uh, uh, adventure. So, um, yeah. Uh, so I'm proud of that book, um, and and you can get it for fifty percent off. Oh, um, and if you want just the digital version, this is for the uh, the book, the uh, hardcover book. Um, but if you want the digital, uh, you can you can also use this and get it for fifty percent off. But you have to use the code uh, Libernicon Digital. And then you can get the, the digital version. So, um, anyway, uh, I I hope that um, 
that uh, spurred on some, some ideas that you can take away uh, for either running or playing in your next game. And uh, I hope that maybe uh, it raised some questions uh, or, or ideas of your own, and, and we can talk about that tonight. Well, well thank you very much. We have four to five minutes. Let's start. Uh, questions? Uh, okay, we go in alphabet. No. Uh, let's start with you. Yeah. Uh, my last name is Baraj. I know it's been a lot about that, but do you have any more tips? Uh, I noticed in most private games, uh, people gather because they're friends, not because they have a common interest in how to play. So there's uh, one power player, one actor, one uh, research and stuff like that. How do you cater to all of them any more things? Right, so uh, uh, the question is uh, how, do you, how do you bring a bunch of different people with different interests together uh, uh, and, and give them uh, what they want? And basically, uh, I think the best thing to do is probably to just be upfront and ask everybody at the beginning of the game, you know, what are you really interested in? What do you want to get out of this? What you know, or maybe what's your what does your character uh, want to to discover or learn or kill? Um, and uh, uh, find that out, and then you know, just explain to everybody because everyone will be there, and they will all be part of the conversation. And and so they will hear. Oh, this you know, first player wants to wants to have lots of interesting combats, but this person wants to uh, uh, you know investigate and explore, and and so they'll know. And you can just tell them, okay, so I am going to try to create a campaign that caters to everybody, and then really do it right. And so you give um, somebody you know a, a chance like. There's something to fight, but there's also something to investigate. And you can even, this, and this is sort of like a, this is sort of an advanced tip, but uh, because it's more difficult. But you can try to create a single encounter that incorporates a lot of that, right? Like, um, you know, there's a big monster to fight, but if the players can go and solve this puzzle on the, you know, on, on the magical statue and, you know, manipulate the statue in a certain way, then that will, you know, cause the monster to take a lot of damage or run away or whatever. So while the, you know, guy who loves to fight is hacking at the monster away, you know, another player can go over and interact with the statue and someone else can, you know, be doing, you know, you know, some maybe freeing the prisoners or whatever. And you, you give them a whole bunch of things to do at once and then they can all kind of divide up and choose and follow their own passion. Yes, yes. Uh, do you have any, any more tips that you didn't put in the book of Wild Darkest about uh, how to lead uh, evil campaigns? Ah, uh, evil campaigns. The question is how uh, tips on running evil campaigns. Um, well, uh, it's been a long time since I've written the book of Wild Darkness, uh, and so I'm not sure I will remember everything that's in there, but, um, you know, my biggest advice, and I'm sure this is probably in the book, but my biggest advice is to really talk to the players and, uh, and kind of get everybody to sign off on the fact that, you know, oh, we're going to be playing evil characters here, and what does that really mean, and, you know, what, what, what you know, there, it's one thing to be, you know, someone who's, you know, kind of self-interested and arrogant and whatnot, and it's another thing to play someone who's a psychopath. And, you know, some people might be comfortable with the first and not with the, the latter and whatnot. And so you kind of have to get a feel uh, uh, and get everyone's sort of consent on what's okay, even though we're all going to play evil characters. And if everyone's on board for just anything goes, well then that's great, and, um, but it's still probably worth checking in with everybody, you know, oh, uh, you know, you, you, 
massacred a whole village last week. Is, is, is everyone okay with that? And, you know, um, and, and if they are, great. Uh, you know, and, and, you know, follow, follow your fun is, is, is sort of my uh, philosophy. Um, but, but make sure that everyone is going to have fun. So over the last few years, we have seen an explosion of online game sessions. So I'd be curious to hear you know, your advice specifically for online sessions. Right. Oh, that, that could be its own panel. Uh, running a game online, um, you know, over, uh, you know, there's a lot of different ways to do it. Uh, uh, Discord and Zoom and, and uh, World 20 and all these different things. Um, and I think... I think that the best way to approach online gaming is to recognize all the challenges that you have that you don't have if you're sitting around a table in somebody's living room. Um, and you know, if if you're playing and everyone is playing, uh, looking at their computer screen, well, we all know that you know you're sitting right there in front of your computer. It's really tempting to just go check your email or you know start browsing uh, you know social media or whatever while the game is going on, and that can be very distracting. It can make the game a lot harder. So it, uh, it, it if you're the game master, it probably behooves you to really kind of watch and see and make sure that everyone is engaged. And you know if you if you see somebody in there you know, their eyes are beginning to drift over to the side of their screen or whatever, um, you know, maybe, you know, bring them back in with, with something that happens. Um, but also just understand that, like, I think that online gaming, and, and I do it all the time, um, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that it, it, it's bad, it's just more challenging. Um, you know, there's like, it's like there's an extra barrier um, between the game master and the players, and also all the players. Um, and so you have to go the extra mile. I think, um, you know, a lot of the advice that we talked about tonight becomes even more important, you know, making sure that things don't get bogged down and the pacing is, is good and, um, you know, maybe consider having shorter sessions because people will get sort of burned out just staring at their computer screen for hours and hours, or make sure you take breaks. Um, and, you know, also be aware that, um, it's funny, we were, we, I was just talking about this earlier, um, you know, be aware that if you're sitting at a table, even if the game master is talking with one player and kind of resolving their action, you can have two other players, you know, at the table, and they're also talking about, you know, what are we going to do next, or you know, whatever. And that's almost impossible uh, when you're doing it online because you know there's sort of only one voice at a time, and so everyone's got to be uh, uh, focused on on that one conversation. And uh, you know, sometimes what you can do is you know encourage the players to use like the some kind of chat or something, some, some side way of, of still having those side conversations, but also just be aware as a game master that you, those probably aren't going to happen. And, um, you know, I always think if, if I'm the game master and I'm talking to a player and we're, you know, resolving how their special ability works or whatever, and there's two other players and they're talking, but they're talking about the game, that's not a bad thing. That's not a distraction. That's a good thing, right? That shows that they're, you know, using the, their time at the table wisely and they're invested in what's going on. And so losing that, I think, is is, is a serious loss. Yeah? Uh, wait. Uh, <laughs> lady with the blonde, blue hair. Hey, so uh, I think that's all the older our uh, time gets less How long should the game be? Uh -huh. It's like a really complicated game. Players sometimes want to continue, but their concentration is zero. And how do you, you as a game master, urge them to stop maybe make a hard stop? Uh, and also, how often should the game happen in a certain campaign for it to not just fizzle out and everyone to lose the details and lose the threads? 
Those are really, really good questions. Um, I, I think I think everyone uh, heard that. Um, and it is it is when when we were working on third edition D and D, um, we did some analysis and. Um, we we thought about what's the biggest competitor to D and D. What's what's what are people gonna possibly be drawn away from D and D to to do? And you know, people thought, oh well, maybe it's it's vampire, uh, or or maybe it's Magic the Gathering, or all these different things. And we decided, no, none of those none of those answers are right. The biggest competitor to D and D is real life, <laughs> and uh, it. You know, it, it, and like you say, it only gets worse kind of as you get older and you get jobs and you have kids and uh, it just becomes more difficult to get together. And so, I mean, I don't think that there is a right answer for how often you should play or for how long you should play. But I do think that it's a conversation that you should have as a group and, and kind of decide what works best for everyone. But um, I will also uh, add to that, no matter what you decide to do, um, uh, I think that taking a break, like figuring out, okay, we're gonna play, let's say you decide to play for four hours. Maybe at two hours, you take a break um, and give everybody a chance to, you know, uh, uh, grab a snack or just, you know, have a smoke or, or, or even just call home and see how the kids are doing. Um, and, uh, and th that's really important, um, and, and it, it's really helpful if you establish that because then everyone does all of those things at the same time. Um, if you don't do that, then people are going to get up from the table, uh, you know, and you're never going to have everybody around the table at one time because every, you know someone has gone to the to the restroom and someone else is in the kitchen, and uh, and, and that can be difficult. Um, Another thing that I would really recommend, um, and this, this requires a little bit of work, but if you have some way for the group to uh, communicate between sessions, uh, whether that be, you know, uh, uh, like a, a, a Discord or uh, maybe just uh, something, you know, there's, there's a lot of different formats. My, uh, my group uses a, a something called Slack. Um, we all get together, and it's just us. And we, we talk about not only when are we going to get together, but also like, hey, remember that in that last session, you know, I was about to die. So when we get back together, if somebody could ready the heal spell, that would be great. Um, and th those kinds of things um, kind of keep the game in everyone's head. Because sometimes, you know, you might only play once a month, right? And that's a lot of, that's a lot of real life that gets in the way and makes you forget what was going on and um, makes, makes things that much harder when you finally do get together, which is uh, kind of a, a ironic because, you know, it means that you have to spend more time in your session kind of remembering what was going on and... Um, Ah. ah, okay. Um, um, uh, uh, so, um, yeah, that, that kind of communication can make it so that you don't spend all that time at the beginning and waste what, what becomes very precious, right? That, that rare, you know, three, four hours that you can all manage to fit it into your schedule and play the game. Um, and you, you, you find, or at least I find, that you know, the less often you play, sort of the more you want to get out of every single moment of the game session. And you don't want to spend a lot of it uh, uh, you know, catching up or remembering what's going on. Um, the other thing that, I, one more thing that I will add, and that is, um, you know, because we often play with our friends and sometimes that's the only time that we see those friends, right? We get together um, every every two weeks, but but I haven't seen my my friend for two weeks, and you know, uh, if we want to make sure that we play the game, I think like 
being conscious of the fact that, you know, maybe set aside an hour at the beginning, that, you know, people can kind of come in when they want, but it's it's time to social, be social and catch up and, and see how you've been doing and how's your job going, um, and have those conversations so that at the beginning of the game session, you can really play and you can get the most out of that time. And, you know, I, I know some groups do that at the end, some some groups do it at the beginning, um, but recognizing that that's important, right? Because we're doing this because it's a social activity with our friends and we want to interact with our your friends and see how they're doing, um, but we also want to play this game. So, uh, you know, kind of creating a balance. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned at some point uh, that there should not be a wall What's your opinion on GM screens and making like the, the <laughs> and, I mean like making the, the secret roles um, and not having the role like in the middle of the table, even as a GM, um, you know, for Um, so uh, the the question is uh, uh, about GM screens, rolling dice in secret, or or you know being more forthright and open and transparent. Um, I think it's really a matter of personal preference. Um, I personally um, very, very rarely use a GM screen anymore. Um, and I think it's because it creates this psychological barrier, um, you know, and it, I think it sometimes too much, it makes it so that it's like, I'm the GM and I'm I'm special and important and you guys are just the players and you're on the outside of the wall there um, and uh, and so uh, as a personally um, I, I find that troubling but you know it also depends on your environment like if you're playing in a very small area on a small little table and you know, you don't want the players looking at your notes or the books you're using or whatever sometimes a, a gym screen is, is important and it's good for that when it comes to rolling dice, you know, it's, it's, it, the real question that's hidden in that question is, is it okay for the GM to fudge the rolls and, and, and uh, you know, cheat? Um, you know, and is it possible for the GM to cheat? Is the GM the one player who can't cheat? Um, and, boy, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I... I've been doing this for a long time. I've done it both ways. Um, and, you know, on the one hand, it feels when you are victorious and you succeed and you know, you know that it, the, the GM is playing it straight the whole time and, you know, you got to see, oh, you know, that really is what the, what the monster rolled there at the end and the dragon, you know, did miss me and, and so we were able to beat him. That feels great, um, and you know if there's something kind of niggling in the back of your mind, like, well, you know, we defeated the dragon, but did we? I think the GM might have been kind of uh, manipulating the rules a little bit, and so the, the success feels less. Um, so what I actually think is the perfect situation is where the GM does kind of manipulate things behind things to, to make the story better, but tells the players that he never does that. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, and, and so you can, uh, you know, it kind of becomes sort of a, an exercise in acting, right? You know, when, oh my gosh, I, I can't believe I rolled another three. Uh, you know, and, uh, it, you know, sometimes that doesn't work. Uh, some people aren't very good at it. Uh, I have done that a lot. <laughs> don't, don't tell my players. Uh, we'll, we'll edit that part out of the video. And, uh, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I, I, I sort of think that that's the best of both worlds. Um, but, but really, it depends on the, on the people and um, what, what they want. And, and I don't think there's necessarily a right or wrong. Okay, I have a few questions, but I want to ask only one, and maybe secondly, there is time later, later on. Um, and it's about the dilemma between the theory of the mind and using the battle page. Uh, yes. Um, because following your uh, 
Though I see both advantages and disadvantages of using the grid. And one of the advantages is actually that you have some kind of shared imaginary space. This is a representation of that space when someone goes for a call and comes back, you know, oh, he moved. I can see, no one needs to tell me, and so on. On the other hand, you can really get like three millimeters here, two millimeters there, and so on. So, what do you think about that? Right, so uh, just for the people in the back, the, the, the question is you know, the, the, using the, the shared imaginary space, the theater of the mind, where you are uh, you know, sort of all imagining what's going on versus having a, a, a battle grid with you know, maybe miniatures or tokens or you know, M&Ms or whatever you like to use um, to, to show where people are. And like you, I see advantages in both. Um, I... Uh, I think that um, the problem, but but I also see disadvantages of both. And ultimately, um, in my own games, for me and my group, we've pretty much universally decided to go completely theater of the mind. And part of that uh, was sort of uh, my 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 friend Bruce uh, uh, put it best when he said that when you're playing on the battle grid and you're you know. Focused on your character sheet and, and and you know your where your character is on the t you play the game you play the game like this right you're sitting at the table and you're staring down at the the, the battle grid or whatever but if you're playing in theater of the mind then you play the game like this right and you're looking at everyone else and you're interacting and it, it becomes less a matter of being sort of closed in and more of uh, participating in, with the group. And uh, I really like that way of looking at things. Um, and, and so for me, uh, it's worth giving up the advantage of, of having you know, a, a, a discrete battle grid or whatever. Because you know, like, how many times do you, when you're playing on the battle grid, you know, and somebody you know is using some kind of counter or something for their character, right? And they know that they can move three squares, right? And they go one, two, three, and all of a sudden it feels like you're playing a board, you know, a Monopoly or a children's game of you know how far you get to move, and um, it, it 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 loses some of the fantastic elements, and you know, uh, particularly like if you start to play with uh, lots of miniatures. Um, it, if you can afford to have all the right miniatures for all the monsters and creatures and it looks just like what it does and you make this beautiful dungeon or whatever, great. But most of us can't do that, right? And so you're like, okay, so uh, this penny is uh, the orc and uh, this six-sided die is the ogre and, you know, it, 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 it almost creates a barrier to the imagination, right? Because you know, rather than just kind of being in the theater of the mind and imagining an orc and an ogre, you're like looking at this grid with a, a penny and a, and a die on it. And um, so, so for me, I'm gonna always say theater of the mind um, and, and make it up to the, to the, make it the responsibility of the game master to remember, you know, where everyone is and, 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 and reiterate and say, okay, now, you know, at the start of a new round or whatever, you say, okay, so uh, you're over by the door and you were, you know, looking down the well and, you know, you were, you were over here uh, tending to the wounded um, and, you know, kind of refresh everyone's memory of where everyone is because, you know, if, if the guy who you said was over by the door said, no, 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 I'm over here by the well, that you want to know that ahead of time. Um, and you don't want that to be in the middle of, of someone talking about their action. And uh, I think it works well. And you know, and if you have to, in the middle of, of, of a complicated scenario or whatever, you can just draw on a piece of paper a quick sketch of, of what it looks like and you know, write an X, you're here, you're here, you're here. And that can give everyone that, that brief visualization without being tied to the battle grid for every single thing. You are correct. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to use the thing that I have in my hand. One of the first uh, uh, space uh, notes was about uh, the shared imaginary space. How do you go from short description to players asking questions about the place and not what do you do? 
I think that um, I think you can combine what you do with them asking questions by rather than just saying what do you do. I mean, it's always good to say what do you do, right? That the, that's one of my favorite. It's one of my favorite parts of of gaming, actually. What do you do, right? Because then it's it's exciting and interesting. But um, but you can say what are you going to look at first, right? You can say uh, what 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 catches your eye. What 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 seems most interesting here to you? And you can kind of start things off that way. Um, and, and some, if you say that to a player, they will sometimes take that as what do you do. And so if you say, well, what, what interests you in this room the most? They might say, well, I'm going to go over and look at the statue, right? Or, or, or whatever it is that they're going to do. And, um, and so it becomes kind of an answer of both. Because if somebody says, well, I'm going to go over and look at the statue, that's another way of saying, what does the statue look like? Right, it it, it 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 begs the question, um, and and so I think you can kind of mesh those two things together. Uh, second round. Okay. Ooh, roll initiative. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, first. Okay. Uh, I've read a lot of uh, many different gaming systems, uh, from very crunchy to not very crunchy. And all of them deal, I mean, are faced with this particular dilemma, but none of them I have found answer it, and I really want to get someone who designs games for a living to answer it. At what point should the GM definitely let the players know the AC of the dragon is 26, the Dark Knight has a plus 9 to hit, like the meta stats information, is it always never very early on, like how, how would that information turnover have to look like? I think, uh, does everybody hear, hear that? I, um, so I think that, um, I think that the right answer is probably um, somewhere in the middle of that, of that encounter or that situation. Um, because I think that in revealing that kind of game, stat information early on, it, you know, if you're fighting a, a, a dragon and you want initially, you want the first thought in the player's mind is of, oh, we're fighting a dragon, right? Not, we're fighting something with, you know, AC 22 and uh, 503 hit points, and, right? It, it, you, don't want it, you don't want them to be facing a big bag of numbers. Right, you want them to be facing a dragon, but you know, after a while, you know, maybe after a first couple of rounds of combat, you've they're rolling dice, and you know, and some players will just figure it out anyway. Right, they'll oh, I you know, of course, his AC must be twenty two because um, you know you hit and you missed and you rolled this, and um, but but even if they don't, I think it, at some point, it it just becomes kind of um, well. In English, we would we would use the word precious. Uh, that you become too, you know. Oh, you know, you missed. Oh, you and and like you're kind of keeping that information to yourself, and it just kind of it, after a while it becomes annoying. Uh, you know, just just tell me. You know, what do I need to roll? Do I need to roll a thirteen or a fourteen? And um, and and that if you do that later in the encounter, it. It, it, but they're already thinking, oh, we're fighting a dragon, and you know all this interesting stuff is happening, and I'm immersed in the fantasy of it. Then, um, you know, if if you know, okay, I need to roll a fourteen, then you can roll, see that it was not a fourteen, and you know that you missed, and you don't have to think about the game mechanics anymore, right? It, 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 in the, in, if you do it too early, you're putting the game mechanics in front of the story, but if you do it if you don't ever do it, then the game mechanics start to become a barrier, right? Because, um, you know, when we, uh, when we were working on third edition, um, we, we micro-analyzed game sessions down to a very fine point, to the point where we, you know, figured out, well, how long does it take to roll a 20-sided die 
and add a number to that die in your head and then tell the game master what your response what your your result is and for the game master to determine how long you know that whether that's a success or failure and you know and, and maybe that's you know two and a half seconds right or whatever it's it's not very long but then when you when you start to figure it out and in the in an average like four hour session that experience of rolling the die, adding a number to it, telling the game master what you got, the game master references that, you know, in that 2.5 seconds, that might happen 500 times that night, right? And so suddenly you, you, you begin thinking about, well, that's a lot of time of a game session that you are spending doing this one activity. Um, and so, you know, we would do things like we would, uh, we would reduce the number of, of roles that were required. Like in, um, you know, I don't, I, I, I don't know, um, you know, if everyone remembers or anyone remembers second edition. But in second edition, for example, you rolled initiative every single time, every single round, uh, yeah, new round, you rolled initiative, and the, you know, you think, oh, that it's just a second or two to roll a new die and tell the GM what, what you get, but. You know that adds up, and so by making it only one roll for one combat, actually ended up saving all this time um, that could be then better used for you know interesting things. Maybe you get a whole, maybe you get a whole another encounter in your game session because you're rolling initiative that way. And so um, uh, I don't know, I don't know how I got off on this tangent, but um, you know you you don't want the game mechanics to be getting too much in the way. So I have a, a question that's kind of like a long question and there's a lot of things to be. It's about the, if you could talk a bit, share some tips on the, like uh, as a game master on getting uh, inspiration and like uh, when it's a long term game, how to do it, burn out, uh, when it comes to like inspiration, blah, blah. And uh, how it's connected to also originality, like how to keep everything interesting, new, long-term, original, and uh, when it comes to like creation like that, how does this affect uh, in, uh, like publishing games and settings and game design, if that makes sense? It, it does make sense, and it, uh, that's a very complex topic, um, and uh, so, you know, ultimately it's, it's uh, the question is about um, where, you know, how do you, how do you get, New ideas and keep things fresh and 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 avoid burnout and um, uh, you know it. Um, again, I'm not here. I'm not here to sell books, but but this book actually talks a lot about these topics. Um, and uh, you know, just real quickly, I would say um, I think that. I think that the best ideas that can come, that you can work into a, a role-playing game campaign actually come from places other than role-playing games. Um, uh, you know, whether it be, you know, a movie that you watch, a book that you read, you know, looking at the news and, and seeing something that happens in the real world and saying, oh, well, what if that happened in, in the fantasy world that I'm, I'm creating? Um, and, and just kind of pulling that in and, and just kind of making yourself open so that you're always sort of greedily taking all the ideas that you come upon and, and sometimes you're you know, tossing them away and sometimes uh, you're using them, sometimes you write them down in your notes and you're going to use them in six months from now. And um, it... Uh, it, it can be very difficult, um, and and it can lead to burnout. And so, uh, what I often encourage people, you know, sometimes we have, uh, you know, there's, you've got one person in the group, and they're always the game master, right? And um, and and if they if they're happy with that, then that's great. But sometimes, even the person who says, "I love being the game master. I always want to. I want to run the game." Even even one game session where you just take a break and somebody else plays a, a one shot a one session game and they the game master gets to be a player gets to see what it's like on the other side. Not only can that kind of refresh and, and cure the burnout, but it it will give you a new insight. I think 
um, I think that it is, it, it's almost dangerous, I would say, to never be a player um, because uh, you kind of got to know what that's like. You got to know what that experience is like. And, and you know, it, it will teach you, oh, you know, my players probably want to know this kind of information because when we played before and I was a player, I wanted that kind of information. Um, and I don't remember the rest of your question. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, something like uh, how to keep, take, like when you take inspiration from other things, uh, like how to, I guess, not rip it off too much, how to keep it original and all that, and how, I mean, obviously you can't always be 100% original, but how does this affect like publishing games? And, uh, well, right, so how does, how does that uh, affect publishing in terms of, of you know, stealing other ideas, yeah, being influenced by other ideas. So when it comes to playing games just for fun, and I know that I'm never going to, uh, uh, I'm never going to, you know, make what I'm working on into a into a published product. I will rip off things left and right. right? If it's if it's if it's fun and cool, and it would make the 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 session better, you know. Great. I mean, when I was uh, when I was first starting out, um, you know, as a as a young kid, and I was running games. You know, yes, everyone had a lightsaber, and uh, you know, there was you know we, we, I, they they would fight. They fought Sauron, and you know, I just uh, was stealing from everything, um, and. Uh, I don't do that quite as much anymore as an adult, but but it actually doing that as a as a young gamer, uh, it kind of taught me, you know, what what things are cool in a game and what aren't. So uh, it was actually very useful, and so I think that you know, unless you think that you're actually going to uh, be creating something for publication, I wouldn't worry about that very much at all. Um, but there is another thing um, that comes into that. If, you, if, you, if you're playing uh, with just your group and you're, and you're not talking about publication, you want to change the things that, you, that you're taking as inspiration enough so that, that people can have the illusion that it's not The Witcher. Um, and uh, you know, that, that, that it is different enough or you've changed just enough so that uh, it, it does feel a little different, and, and they're in this new and original world. And, and as long as it feels a little bit original, I think all the players will be super happy and will we'll forget that it's just like Lord of the Rings or it's just like Game of Thrones. Um, because it's not just like it. Um, but uh, ultimately, to answer your question, you, know, you can't do any of that. Uh, if you're going to do it for publication, or you or you need to make the changes so big and dramatic that it really becomes something new, um, you know, we're all influenced all the time by the things that we watch and read and uh, and whatnot, and you can't help but take inspiration and ideas from that. Um, but uh, you know, sometimes. We talk about it in terms of filing the serial numbers off, uh, and um, you know you, you really have to do that a lot if you're if you're looking at publication because you don't want someone to say, "Oh, this is just The Witcher." Yeah, no, uh, uh, you know, uh, take more questions out of this round. Uh, yes, you. Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, I wanted to ask you. I'm very glad you pointed out motivation. I was recently acquainted with the idea of players and characters having really specific motivations, playing uh, the World of Darkness system, where it's codified as in the sense of aspirations and obsessions and so on. Players really say what they want from the game, and it's an intrinsic game mechanic. Yes. And they get rewarded with experience and so on. Right. So I, was, uh, I had a lot of difficulty uh, speaking to my players and trying to get them to the, divorce their players, uh, their player motivations and their character motivations. Because a lot of people think they're the same thing. You know, right. I've played with people who 
always think they're almost treating the game as like a method actor. They're always a character and they're always trying to, you know, immerse themselves. And I've played with people who treat their characters like path blocks because they really enjoy crunch and combat. So, right. so how can I help people divorce these things and try to make peace between them? So I think that um, a, a way to get people to uh, sort of divorce those those two issues and, and, and look at just, uh, I, I would start with player motivation. I would start with, you know, what do you want as a player in this game? What, you know, what kinds of things are you going to be interested in? And I think that that's the kind of question that, you know, given a little bit of time, anybody can kind of come up with an answer for. Even if it's something simple like, I just want to be here to, you know, have fun with my friends, right? That's an okay reason to be at the game. Um, and but 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 maybe it's you know I want to start my own empire or you know I want you to do all these things um, and then what I would do uh, for character motivations is I would encourage the players to start there don't don't figure out all your stats and your abilities and whatnot figure out what your goals are what your character motivation what does your character want right. You know, we all have wants, and what what do you want? And then encourage them to design their characters, stats, and abilities to to make that happen, right? Um, you know, I you know uh, I want money more than anything, right? My character is very driven by money, and I just want to uh, uh, make the most money that I can. Well, okay, so. You know, depending on the game, maybe you're going to take a lot of skills that allow you to be a thief, but maybe you're going to take a lot of skills to be a good businessman, right? Uh, you know, it just it depends on the game that you're playing. But if you start with the character motivation rather than starting with the stats, I think that, that that's really good, and it, it keeps those, those game stats and mechanics from getting in the way, because I think if you start with the game mechanics, and then you say, well, what do you, does your character want? You know, people just kind of look down at their character sheet and they say, well, a uh, magic sword would be cool, right? I mean, you know, it, 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 it becomes harder to come up with those sort of big motivations. Uh, that was, yeah, okay. You can go. Okay. Uh, I want to ask about the choices matters at the shared space and uh, what place the design of the rules because it, the rules create limits and expectations inside the game what is possible, what isn't, what can and how do you approach uh, dealing with the mechanics either in the single campaign or in the design of the system uh, <coughs> to reflect okay, how the rules will encourage, play, uh, encourage player to make the choices that he, that give and the rule will give them expectations as well as how to create the rules that will enable the shared space so that everyone knows what is possible what are the limits and and still keep it open that anything could can happen because someone thought of it <laughs> <laughs> yes yes so uh, there is a there is a sort of an, an eternal struggle there, right? Because we say, well, you know, whatever you can imagine can happen, but at the same time, we've got these rules that say, oh, that's not going to happen. Um, and uh, I think that it it become like so. Sometimes uh, when I'm talking about role playing games, I say that there are there are three sort of forces at work at the game table. There's the game master, there's the players, and there's the rules. And when you are when you are participating in a game, as a group, I think you need to decide which one of those three forces is the most important. And uh, you know, if it's if it's the if it's the players, then you're focusing a lot on their goals and their motivations, and uh, and and. and Kind of maybe tailoring the rules to work with that and whatnot. If it's the game master, then it's it's sort of you know well, 
it's all it all comes down to them and what they say goes, and it becomes very uh, you know one one person kind of makes the decisions is the arbiter, and if it's the rules, well then you know. My God, you you go by what the rules are saying, like it is written in holy text, and uh, you know you, you 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 stick with that. And I, I I think that there isn't necessarily a right or wrong answer. I think that everyone is going to want to play differently, um, and and so you know if you want to play a more open game where the players are 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 freer to do you know kind of get inspired and, and come up with a, a crazy way to maybe solve this situation rather than, you know, just uh, uh, using the mechanics as they're written. Um, if you want that kind of game, it's easy to, to, to be, as a game master, be sort of permissive and say, okay, well, that might work, but you're going to have to make this role and that role and, you know, and, and, and do that. Um, you know, if you, you know, if you don't want to fight the orcs, but you want to sneak into their camp and and make them poison pancakes or something and defeat them that way, uh, you know, you can uh, allow that, but it's going to still require some kind of mechanics or whatever. Um, or you can look at the rules and say, okay, well, there are no rules for that, so you just have to fight them with swords. Um, and uh, it, it really just depends on what you want out of the game, um, and uh, I don't know, does that answer your question? Um, it, it, it just really, it's a decision that you have to make. It, it, there is no right or wrong. Yeah, but it's a decision that the whole group has to make, not just Yes, the yes, the whole group sort of has to be on board. You know, we're gonna play a game where, you know, things are gonna uh, be kind of loose, and, and you know, if you come up with an imaginative idea, go with it. Um, or you say, well, we're going to play this game very strictly by the book um, and whatnot. Or we're going to play this game where the, the game master, the dungeon master, you know, what they say goes. Um, and those are all good, good choices, um, but different for different people. So we're going to play really by the book and we're over time, so we can time <laughs> for only five more questions or something like that. Uh, if you haven't raised hand before, there's one, two, three questions, and and we'll see what then, and then we have one candidate, and he was another one. So that's it. Uh, we have three questions, and then possibly two more. Let's go. Okay, I have a question about pacing. Uh, I play a lot of uh, people five edition, maybe, and some five hundred, and combat gets to too long sometimes, and. I know you created some, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just wondering how do you face the combat in such such systems? You know, and uh, you want to describe the attack, but also you want to do I don't know, 17, five, six attacks for the character, and you need to all do this math, and you need to use all this ability to be cool, and you know, it's a lot in one in one session to do. We can like three or four hours just combat in the session. And that's for me a lot, and I'm, I'm seeing that. Uh, I don't know. It's, it's a bit too long. It, it it can get it can get very long. Combat can get uh, long, and and often, like if there's a long combat, but it's really exciting and interesting, nobody complains. But if it's just okay, I attack again, and and it, it becomes very repetitive, then then that's when it really starts to seem like it bogs down. So one way to do that is. Is to try to make the 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 encounter so interesting, so challenging, uh, and I don't just mean tough, but I mean like there's lots of different things to do um, that that nobody cares that it takes that long. But there are also tricks, um, and it requires everyone at the table to sort of work together. Um, but you know, if you're making multiple attacks, you know you can well well well. We're resolving one player's actions. You can be rolling your dice and adding your numbers and and your modifiers and whatnot, and so that when it comes your turn, because you know you know it's following initiative order, you know when your turn is coming, you can just say, okay, well, 
I made, I made three attacks and I got these numbers and, and these results. And, and, and that can speed things along. Um, where I think combat can get really bogged down is when you're you know, sort of going around the table and uh, you say, okay, well, it's your turn. And the person says, okay, and it hasn't given any thought to what they're going to do and has to kind of, well, you know, what spell should I cast? And opens up the book and, right, and everyone has to wait five minutes for them to, to pick out their spell and whatnot. Um, and so the more you can do that ahead of time, uh, the more you can kind of speed things along, right? So if you can get to the point where, you know, if you've got, everyone's on board with this, right? You can get to the point where you're going through actions very, very quickly, and uh, it can really speed things along. The last thing that I'm going to say is going to seem like sacrilege. It's going to seem, you're, you're, you're not even going to, you're, you're going to lose all respect for me when I say this. But sometimes you're in the middle of a combat or maybe starting to get toward the end and it is clear what's going to happen, right? But, you know, there's only, there's only, you know, four of the guards left and two of them have already, you know, taken some damage and whatnot. And yeah, it'll probably go on for three or more, more rounds of, of attacks and hits and misses and whatnot. At that point, I'll just say, you know what? Uh, you 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 emerge victorious, yeah. right? You, uh, you 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 defeated them, um, and you know uh, sometimes if you do that, and 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 no one has ever done that for a player before, you'll you'll see people go what? But, but we didn't keep track of all the hit points, and and you know and um, but. But I think that combat gets boring when, okay, we know how this is going to turn out. We just have to do the math and make all the die rolls and go through the process. And, and there's no reason for that. Um, that you, know, you can just say, or, you know, like sometimes if I'm playing and, I, and, the, and the players are high level and they come upon two first level guards. Uh, I, I won't even say roll initiative. I'll just say, okay, well, you know, after, after you know, they do their best to hold you back, but you're you're much more powerful than them, and uh, you you defeat them and, and get to the door. And uh, like I said, I know that sounds like like a, a blasphemy, um, but uh, it it takes sort of the dullness out of the game, and it gets you to the exciting parts more quickly because the exciting parts are okay now we're fighting the, the big evil wizard and we don't you know he's gonna cast weird spells and he's gonna you know summon a demon and, and all these interesting things are we gonna be able to defeat him we don't know that's where the game is really interesting and nobody's gonna complain about that battle going long because there's all these interesting things and we might die and, and whatnot so you know get to the good parts, right? It's like you're watching a movie and, and you know, you know the, how this scene turns out, so you just fast forward uh, and get to the good bits. Um, it, it's kind of the same in a game.